So far, I've just been programming my computer here in assembly. And that works well enough for some simple things, like Pong in my last video. While you can do everything in assembly and do it very efficiently, let's face it, large programs just take a really long time to write, even here where I literally designed the architecture. And for that reason, there are compilers, which are just programs like any other that translate code from a language that's a little easier to work with, like C, back to assembly, so you don't have to write the assembly yourself. As such, in a move that definitely didn't take longer than just writing everything in assembly, I decided to write a compiler. It takes C source code and translates it to assembly for my architecture. For example, and as is tradition, here we have Hello World. I can just compile this, which gets us the assembly. Then I can assemble it to get a binary and upload it. Here we go. That's Hello World. Obviously, it can't just print Hello World. You can pretty much edit this like you used to, to do whatever you want, like printing Hello World 16 times. Very exciting. To explain how this all works behind the scenes, I'm just gonna switch to a simpler example. But what the compiler does is really always the same. The general idea is that we first try to understand the source code, which is called parsing, and then from that build the equivalent assembly code, which does the same thing, just in smaller or different steps. Very abstractly, you could say that we first try to reduce the information to get to the essential part of what the program does, and then expand it once again to express that in terms of instructions. If that was too much, the first step is fortunately very simple and practical. What we're trying to do here is just get rid of all of those pesky characters making up source code, because it's really just one long string. We really don't want to have to store int for every int, or while for every while loop, so we just replace these sequences with tokens. As such, every occurrence of int gets turned into an int keyword, which is marked yellow here. That saves space, because you don't need to store the int anymore, and most importantly, you don't have to deal with characters anymore. For example, if you want to check if this declares an int, then all you do is check if it starts with an int keyword, and not if it starts with an i followed by n followed by t followed by white space, because otherwise, who knows, it could be int32t. Speaking of white space, strictly what I'm doing here is still formatting this is wrong. White space and newlines have been entirely gotten rid of at this point, so all we really have is just a list of tokens, which might look something like this. I'm gonna keep it formatted though, just to keep it readable. And that already was the first step, lexing. We turn the source code to a list of tokens. What do we do with the giant list? Well, we just read it, one token after the other. It's really just a matter of knowing what statements could be there in the C language, and then checking which one of them it really is, and filling in the details. If it doesn't match any of the possible statements, then that's an error. This process is called parsing. For simplicity's sake, let's say we parse the function header already, and we're here. What are the possible things that could be here in C? They could, for example, be an if statement, a for loop, and so on. But in this case, the first token here is an int keyword, and that tells us that this is the declaration of a variable. The next token turns out to be an identifier, a, which we store as the name of the newly declared variable. We also store int as its type. Now there's two options. There could either be a semicolon for just a declaration, or an equals for a definition as well. In this case, we have an equals. After the equals, we expect some sort of value to initialize the variable to. Specifically, that's called an expression, more on that in a second. In this case, the expression is just an int literal. After that, we just check for a semicolon to enter statement. On the side, I've been building this tree structure that encodes what we just parsed. This is what the parser actually outputs, but it's not particularly special. It's really just a handy way of representing the structure of a program for computers. In the next statement, we start off the same. We just have a more complicated expression after the equals. We already know that it can't be anything really simple, like just the literal. It must be something more complex. So we search for operators in the expression. And wouldn't you know it, we find the plus sign. So we know that this is addition. We also know that addition has two arguments. So we simply look at its left side, that's a one, and at its right side, which is a. Therefore we know to add one to the value of a as the result of the expression. The important thing is that the left and right sides can't just be literals or variables. 
they are entire expressions themselves. So if we have something like this, we still find the plus first, then we look at the left argument, which is one, just like before, then we look at the right argument. This time, it isn't just a, it's an entire operation again. We already know how to deal with operations though, we just treat it like the addition earlier, and we get this as the result, just as expected. So by recursively treating the left and right arguments of operators as expressions themselves, we can already deal with arbitrarily long expressions, which is pretty neat. So parsing is just a process of taking a list of tokens and turning it into the tree on the right, which is also called an abstract syntax tree. The next and final stage is code generation. Here we take the abstract syntax tree and turn it into assembly code. This might seem very overwhelming. Like, how do you turn this tree into assembly? They look nothing alike. The way we can still solve this relatively easily is by dividing the problem down. Instead of worrying about generating assembly for the entire tree, we create functions that generate assembly for every single type of node in the tree. To generate code for the entire tree then, we basically just tell the top node, so the function node, to generate its code. We as humans obviously see that the function is made up of two declarations, but the code generator for the function node doesn't know that or really care about that at all. All it knows is that a function is made up of a sequence of statements. So all it does is tell the first statement on the very left to generate its code. That then turns out to be a declaration. So we start the code generation function for declarations, which will create the variable a. Then it needs to know what to initialize a to. We can see that it's two, obviously. But once again, the compiler doesn't know that. All it knows is that this value, whatever it may be, is defined by this expression. So to get the value, it just tells the expression to generate its code and to return its value. It turns out to be an int literal, so there isn't even any code to generate, all it does is return two, which the declaration can then move into a, which it decides is in R0. With that, the first statement is finished. The function code generator, oblivious to anything that just happened, just moves on to the next statement. Once again, the declaration tells the expression to generate its code. It turns out to be an add, which also evaluates its two arguments, first the left, then the right. Now it knows to add together one and the value of a, generates the code to do that, in this case with the result in R1. The declaration can then use that as the initial value for b. With that, we turn the function into assembly. All of that the compiler can do in a fraction of a second. I can also give it this function, and it looks like this. Pretty much the same as we came up with, with some boilerplate code around it. Also, it reuses R0 for b, because a is never used again. I can also add back the multiply here, then it looks like this. As you can tell, the steps just get progressively harder. Lexing is really easy, parsing is tedious at first, but once you've gotten it, it also just works. You don't need to worry about it anymore. Code generation, you can really just sink an infinite amount of time into. It is fairly easy to do very inefficiently. Like this is what an early version of my compiler makes of the same code. But there's a lot of optimizations and case distinctions to get it to be decent. At this point, it is pretty good at doing expressions in isolation, but it doesn't know about some broader optimizations it could do, like here, where there's really no reason to put one into R0 again. Still working on that. Well, at least the assembly works most of the time. Let's move on to some actual sort of useful functions. Here we compute factorial both recursively and iteratively. First, this is what the abstract syntax tree for these functions looks like. Yeah, you can tell why I said this is convenient for computers to read, not so much for humans. Fortunately, we also don't really need to care what this looks like, it's only for the code generator. This now is the final assembly, as generated by the code generator. As expected, the iterative version is a lot shorter. The loop could be done a bit faster, but other than that, because it's so simple, it's pretty much ideal. In the recursive version, it's a bit harder to tell what's going on because everything is on the stack, but you can see the case distinction. In one case, we return one, and the other, we do another recursive function call. Just like before, I can compile and upload this. Then I can go ahead and run it, which is pretty quick. You can see the results of the two functions in R2 and R3. They match, which is pretty nice, and they're even correct, so that's even better. Reading results from registers is kind of questionable though. You already saw printf earlier. I can of course also use that here, which looks like this. 
Oh, and these numbers are large enough to overflow. Let's just fix that. There you go. As you can tell by the much longer assembly with printf, there's already quite some things to writing on the screen. That's because this screen doesn't actually have a text mode or anything. So you need to take care of writing characters yourself, pixel by pixel. For that, we first need some characters, which I have in this array here. Three of these 16-bit numbers represent one 6 by 8 pixel char, so that's exactly one bit per pixel. To make use of this array, there's, among others, this function to actually draw characters. It's already a bit more involved than factorial, but essentially we go through the characters in this loop, and then for each character we go through all the pixels in these two loops, and print either black or the provided color based on the pixel. Usually you can't really see that process because it's too fast, but if I turn down to the lowest clock you can get a glimpse of it. This is what it looks like. With that we can draw characters and strings. Printf can obviously do a little more, so there's also a bunch of functions to write numbers. That's fortunately pretty straightforward. With that we can get to printf. Well, most of the work actually happens in vprintf, where we print a string and if there's a percent then we call one of the other methods. Obviously this is a very tiny subset of printf. Honestly I wouldn't be surprised if real printf was Turing complete. Anyways, in printf itself you can see this weird hack here. That has to do with the variable number of arguments you can pass to printf. In the declaration you can see this dot 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 for additional arguments, but all that really does is tell the compiler to ignore it if you use too many arguments in a printf call. You still don't have any way to access the arguments when you're here in printf. For that, in regular C, the standard library provides something called va underscore args, but since I don't have a standard library, we obviously can't use that. But I did write a compiler, so I do know how function calls work. Specifically, when we do a call to printf like this, the arguments are pushed to the stack in inverted order, so the additional arguments are on the stack below the normal argument, the format string. So what we do is take the address of that string and then subtract one. Then we get a pointer to the first additional argument. In vprintf, we then get the value at that address when we get to the first percent %u and pass it to write num. Then we subtract another one to get the pointer to the next additional argument and so forth. With that, you can use any number of arguments. Without any type or bounds checking, obviously, but who needs that? Now, hopefully, you have an impression of what it takes to get to Hello World. You can check out the source code in the description if you want. The compiler definitely doesn't follow any C standard, but it is entirely written by me, no libraries or anything, and does support most things. Also check out the other video I just released along with this one, where I used the compiler to write something actually useful, a hex editor, and had some fun with it. Anyways, that's it for now. See you next time.